Namathe Vasudevaya. So um, tonight I was going to um, tell you about a story from the Bhagavat Purana, also called the Srimad Bhagavatam, from a section that's called the Uddhava Gita. And these um, particular story involves a person who lived in a kingdom called Avanti in ancient India. And so this, uh, the title of this chapter is the song of the Avanti Brahmana. So it begins with a question that was put to the speaker about how to endure insult and difficulty. And in this story, it really speaks to some very deep subject matter. It discusses and examines karma, the laws of action and reaction. It discusses the nature of the mind and what role it should have and how a mind that is unbridled works to the detriment of everyone. The actual living being, the spiritual being residing in the, within the body becomes actually tormented because of the great power of the mind and how one can and should live to find um, peacefulness and to live on a spiritual platform and to avoid unnecessary suffering. So it begins with the statement, there is virtually no saintly man in this world capable of resettling his mind after it has been disturbed by the insulting words of other uncivilized people. Sharp arrows which pierce one's chest and reach the heart do not cause as much suffering as the arrows of harsh insulting words that become lodged within the heart when spoken by uncivilized people. Can you relate to that? I think a lot of people can relate to that, both on the giving and the receiving end. <laughs> when we become overwhelmed by, you know, powerful emotions and we become swept away, we act in an uncivilized and uncaring way. So in this story, this person, he, although he was, um, educated spiritually, he was very drawn to making money and was highly successful in all his endeavors and accumulated vast amount of wealth and property and, and uh, lands. And he, um, he had these characteristics. He was very harsh in his dealings with others. And he thought that was a necessary part of, of, you know, acquiring the means that he acquired. But he was tremendously miserly. And the more wealth he accumulated, the more he chose to protect it and not let a, a scent escape his grip. And it got to the point where even his own family were deprived of not luxurious living, but even just comfortable living. That he was, he was so miserly in his dealing with everyone. And so they became very pained by, you know, this, this attitude of his. As the years went by and his position became more and more, you know, exp he expanded his wealth and influence it suddenly things began to take a turn as they do in life and money 
was forcibly taken from him in, by taxation, by cheating of others, even relatives, and just by bad decisions and business. And as the time went by and he became more desperate, things actually became worse. And soon he was deprived of everything. I mean, like literally everything. And of course, if you have not had that experience, you may know someone that does this infinitely. You know, there's just a huge number of examples around of, of how this happens to people. And in spite of being of good intelligence and, and a strong mind, he, he could not keep his grip on things as they began to leave him. I mean, this applies also to relationships, to ideas of power or ideas of prestige and being accepted by others and things. This, this is something that, that we will all experience at different times. How for no apparent reason you began losing things that are dear to you and important to you. And when he became literally almost destitute, his entire family turned on him. They were angry now that before, when he had vast means, they could bear his, his miserliness and his harsh speech, thinking that some, down, somewhere down the line there's going to be a payoff. But now, when even that's removed, it's why the hell would I stick with this person? Why would I tolerate it? And so they all turned on him. And because of several reasons, one of them was because his earlier spiritual training, he started to really deeply contemplate what has happened. And one of the things he thought was that he struggled so hard and performed so much austerity for so long to accumulate all this wealth. And then he didn't even use it for charitable purposes or humanitarian purposes, even for maintaining his family, even himself enjoying a, a more luxurious existence. And now it's all removed. And he was thinking, I spent decades decades in this endeavor and now it's gone it's it's flown it's and it was like okay that means all the time i invested in all this and all these efforts were for nothing they were utterly useless i i derived nothing from it it was just hard work and 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 horror and then he began to reflect that I didn't even use or attempt to use this wealth I gained, you know, in the service of mankind, my family or others. And so not only have I lost the money, I have lost the opportunity to do something of value in my life. And so he became deeply reflective on this um, realities is truths and um, he resolved that he would cease engaging in material activity that life is too short and I spent so much time chasing fantasies that in the end meant nothing and I could not hold them and I will not be able to hold them even at death so why do we invest so much time in vain endeavors, chasing over things that in the end bear no fruit and do not help us? He reflected and was very aware that when a person is gifted with good fortune, whether it's in terms of um, personal qualities or abilities or talents or wealth, or opportunities for social advancement. These, these are considered the fruit of previous activity. And once one has used up their store of previous good karma, 
then they are only, that's it. Things do come to an end. And so this often explains the statement when people ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, quite often it's connected to and related to um, past um, karmic activity. For every single action that you perform in this world, there is a reaction. For all the pain that you cause, you will bear the brunt of that. You will experience that. For all of the violence that you um, commit, that will be done to you. For all the good that you do, you will derive pious benefit. And so with this understanding, he became resolved um, to tread the spiritual path. Now this, this part and some of the things I'm going to just mention may be a little bit astonishing to people. And I, I'll just explain something very quickly. The yogic understanding is that you, you this, are a spiritual being. The body does not have life. The reason life is manifest through the body is because of the presence of a spiritual being, which is you. That you have this gross covering and you have a subtle covering made up of the mind and what's called buddhi or the intelligence and the false ego, the false concepts of who I am. And the majority of living beings in this world are lost. They have zero recognition of their actual spiritual existence. We are caught up in the bodies that we currently have, identifying them as me. When anything happens within my mind, I, I take that so seriously and embrace it if I get really upset about something or really pleased about something, I see it in terms of it happening to me. But in the yogic teaching, they really want us to go a little further. Because if you remain on that, what is called a superficial level, then you must be faced with unlimited amounts of difficulty that there will be constant difficulty and suffering that comes your way. There will be moments of exhilaration and moments of great unhappiness. And these things always go together. But actually they have nothing to do with your deeper spiritual being. So being really absorbed in this understanding and at last finding tremendous peace, he became a wandering monk a sannyasi. And even then, he, he chose not to reveal his actually elevated spiritual condition, the great realization that he had come to. He was a very humble person now in this state. But because of it, people took advantage of him um, and were actually often very cruel and mean to him. There were times when people would accuse him of being a thief or a, you know, they would just make jokes about him, they would tease him, um, they would beat him with sticks sometimes. He, he experienced, I mean, it's like horrors. He would beg for his meals and just live a very simple, deeply spiritual life. But then sometimes he, there were instances when he's sitting beside a river with food that he has begged about to eat it. Somebody reportedly came and urinated on the food to, because they just didn't like him. And, and he just showed this incredible level of tolerance for all of these terrible things that would sometimes come his way and had come his way, you know, through his life. And he composed a deeply poetic and, and beautiful um, song. And this particular chapter in the Puranas is called the Song of the Avanti Brahmana. 
And this song had deep spiritual import, which he would sing and, and meditate upon and find deeper spiritual happiness from his life. So um, he uh, I've just re I, I, I'm thinking I've bitten off more than I can chew here. There's so many topics in here that we actually need to really deal with, but we're just going to hop, hop over them, because they're actually incredibly important for us in our own effort and endeavor to find our way through this life, this experience that we call life, and to face with great clarity and complete fearlessness the end of the time in this body known as death. So, um, He reflected on one thing. You see, the yogis, one of their primary focuses of the meditation was on a feature of the supreme, referred to as the supreme soul, that resides actually within the heart of all living beings. There is a lot of really quite fantastic um, descriptions of how the living being, the spiritual being, or the soul, if you like, um, is situated within the body, r sitting upon or, or resting in five principal types of air or prana that move through the body. But along with this living being, there is another being. There is the, um, who is called the supreme soul. And by reuniting with this um, feature known as the Supreme Soul. And in Sanskrit, it's called Paramatma, which means the Supreme Soul. One is able to regain everything that they feel that we have been separated from. The desire for intense love, for great happiness and blissfulness. This all resides in this spiritual realization. So, um, I'm, I'll, I'll just read a few verses and, and it's, I'll post them on Facebook as well. Um, so, in your life, if you would like to go back and read these and contemplate upon them, it would probably be somewhat helpful. He said, all the senses, meaning the sense of speech, of sight, of taste, of touch, of smell, of hearing. There, there are five um, uh, knowledge acquiring senses and five senses for activity. So they are under the control of the mind since time immemorial. And yet the mind itself never comes under the sway of another. He is, the, he is stronger than the strongest and has almost godlike power, which is fearsome. Therefore, anyone who can bring the mind under control becomes the master of the senses. Failing to conquer this irrepressible enemy, the mind, whose urges are intolerable and who torments the heart, many people are completely bewildered and create useless quarrel with others. Thus they conclude that the other, other people are either their friends, their enemies, or indifferent to them. And it's kind of like, when you hear this, most people go like, what? Because we've never thought of anything like this before. The reality that we can be put into difficulty by the mind is becoming increasingly apparent. We live in a, in a society, in a time 
where we have become absolutely enslaved by these ridiculous devices. There are, as has been stated, it's described as an epidemic of unhappiness, greater than, than it's ever been at any other time in, in history. Myself, having lived most of my life in third world countries, in where people are tremendously, huge communities, of tremendously impoverished people. I mean, the, the entire population of, of New Zealand lives in just one, just one slum, either in Manila or Mumbai or Calcutta or Delhi or, you know, parts of China. I, I'm serious. And, and, and they, you know, when, when people that are not accustomed to these things, you know, see something like that and become exposed to them, they become all disoriented and, and flipped out and they can't understand how, how could you even exist like that? Whereas people that are experiencing this type of situation are actually capable of living in a very extraordinarily kind and happy way, even deprived of all of this. Whereas on the other hand, we have societies that are enormously, I mean, the amount of wealth amongst common people in the world, it's never, it's never been at this level. And yet we've got rates of suicide, the amount of mind-altering substances, all varieties of intoxicants that people take, billions and billions of dollars just to get through the day. In the yoga system, we learn that the mind, if unbridled, is like a wild horse. You get on it and it runs and you're just hanging on for dear life and it's going to all kinds of places. You know, I, I, I give meditation classes in the maximum security prison, you know, and, and are constantly encountering people who have allowed their mind to get the better of them. And in moments of rage, in moments of just envy of so many things. People are killed, people are raped, violence is committed and everything. And it all starts in the region of the mind. Having an uncontrolled mind and then feeling like if I chase all the desires that are manifesting there, I will find happiness. And that's absolutely a lie. There is no connection between happiness and sensual stimulation. I can take drugs, I can engage in sexual activity, I can eat, I mean, the world has turned into foodies. It's just like crazy town, where everybody's just like whipping the tongue. And, and you know, you can, you can engage in all this activity and experience high amounts of, of pleasurable, sensual experience and be utterly unhappy, utterly alone. So if we want to do something about our situation, there is a necessity to consider the role that the mind plays in our life and the nature of my relationship with it. Most people don't even think in terms of their mind is something that you have a relationship with. Whatever's happening in the mind, I'm doing it. Because I feel it's, it is me, it is happening to me, and I need to follow it in order to be fulfilled. This particular account that I related to you, and I'll, I'll post a few more verses on, online, you know, really deeply examines the nature of life, of where happiness can be found, the nature of karma, 
And it speaks to the real need to consider what is actually of great value. What is of great value? So um, that was a little bit more serious than my other stories, wasn't it? Anybody have any question? All, all yoga processes are very much focused or deal with the need for us to gain actual control over our mind and for us to be using the mind as a tool to live a life that is purposeful that is happy, that is filled with love and good things. And if we go the other route and we become simply a tool of the mind and we are constantly just chasing it and following it and giving in to whatever it's demanding or, or enticing me to do without any consideration of whether that's going to be actually helpful or not, one cannot experience actual happiness. One of the things that you'll see if you read these verses that I post is that if we are experiencing unhappiness in our life, on many different levels, not just the obvious level, Wherever we find ourselves, it is the result of past decisions and past actions. So we are largely responsible for our happiness and unhappiness. Largely. And that we need to spend our time thoughtfully acting in ways that are productive in ways that generate great outcomes that make our life happy, purposeful, and very much worth living. So the message in, in these verses that he speaks of is that really, instead of blaming everybody else constantly for all my misfortune, I must recognize that on in different ways I have, I, I've contributed. And rather than wallowing in this, I need to begin to lead a life, an enlightened life, of very purposeful living, making decisions, making choices, engaging in actions that produce fantastic outcomes. This is the way for us to become happy. Yes. You were speaking about how in his earlier years our, our sage was mean-spirited and uh, he sounded like Scrooge McDuck. Um, he didn't want to give him to anybody. And um, it's sort of, I guess it's a little bit surprising that then all of a sudden he was in such an elevated condition. It's sort of like, Okay, I, there are actually many accounts, and, and perhaps if it happens, we've got a, something next Saturday, right? Nothing on Sunday, and but maybe the week after, if I'm still here, I'm meant to go to Australia for a bit of a speaking tour. Um, I'll, I'll speak about another one, another amazing story about this person called Adjumila. The reality is to have the association of someone that is more spiritually advanced than myself will impact my life. To allocate some time to study spiritual truth or to hear spiritual truth will plant seeds that can help us. It is possible for a person to be of a quite um, good disposition and, you know, on a, on a very level sort of platform to spiral from there into really hellish situation. 
because that's the nature of material entanglement. This is the nature, the effect of things. If we are not going to be in control of our life and make decisions that are for our benefit, then we will, things will be forced upon us practically. But even if a person falls into a really bad situation, if in that situation they reflect or they are prayerful and they go, what the hell just happened? They are capable of receiving insight. They are capable of having insight and they can make decisions to radically turn things around. There are so many stories of this. It does not matter how far down the stairs you tumble. It doesn't matter how lowly is the position that we find ourselves in. We have to understand that what is happening is happening to the body and mind. The spiritual being within is always eternal, is always situated in its rightful place. And I must reconnect with that. It's not like I've got to become strong and pull myself out of tragic and difficult circumstances. No, by becoming absorbed in this understanding of my eternal spiritual nature, then I know that with the, with mercy, with help, with a blessing, that I can find myself out of even the most fallen and difficult condition. I must be patient. And the main way in which this will happen, the main thing that will transform my life, the main thing that will give me realization and insight is the practice of this chanting of transcendental sound, these mantras. This is, will have a profound and transformative effect on us. Okay? Thank you very much. Um, if anybody ever wants to ask anything or delve a little deeper in something or they need a little bit of help, I'm not so much into um, personal stuff, but personal stuff always got a bigger, there's a bigger picture there. And if I can be of any help or assistance to anyone, please don't hesitate. Feel, feel free. Yeah. On, I'll put them on Facebook and on my YouTube channel and website. Um, on my Facebook. I mean, Mantra Night, you guys feel free to re-copy uh, any of this stuff and use any of it. <laughs>